This week on Gravel, we go through what it takes to get a drink in Utah. We talk about what critter group we want to get rid of. You got to tune in. You want to hear this. And finally, dog diarrhea and anal glands. It's on Gravel. Okay, here we go. Well, greetings. I hear you have a bad case of gravelitis that can only be cured in one way. You've reached On Gravel, and we're here to scratch your itch. This is Andrew McKean in real time across the microphone from Ryan Bronson. We are here in Salt Lake City. <laughs> oh, Dinger, you're not Just here. Just holding it down in the Midwest. Somebody's got to man the office. All right, you're doing what you can. So, Eric, we found a place last night that serves Pappy Van Winkle bourbon. And we walked in there, and I said, bartender, give me your cheapest Pappy Van Winkle. <laughs> and he poured us two of them, and they were very good. For us. The beautiful part of it is they were the last of a couple of drinks, and it was I wouldn't have wanted to start with that. No, no, we worked our way up to it. You two were the poorest guys at the country club last night. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and it's an interesting step up. So we had, it was 10-year-old, then it was 15, 20, and 25. And they went up accordingly. But what I appreciated was arithmetic increases. There was nothing crazy about it. I'm not, I, I perceived at the time that they were going up logarithmically. I thought it was on the kin scale as well. <laughs> I just, when I asked, how much is a pour of blank? And they said a number. And I said, I'll have your cheapest. <laughs> and it was fine. I wouldn't have, I couldn't have handled anything else. So Bronson and I are here in Salt Lake City. Uh, we are both board. Well, I got to speak of Bronson in the past tense in a second. We're both on the national board of directors for the Mule Deer Foundation. This is the MDF's big party of the year. It's the Western Conservation and Hunting Expo. Or do I have that wrong? Is it nope. hunting and conservation? Conservation always comes first. Yes. Uh, it's put on with another group called Sportsmen for Fish and Wildlife. This hopefully will be the last time I ever mention them on air. Uh, but anyway, it's a great big ol' bring your kids and kick tires of big trucks and think about drinking Mountain Ops tonics. And kind of, there's a real demographic to the place. And I'm not going to make any religious asides. But what I notice in Utah, the, the typical Utah hunter is one of two kind of phenotypes. It's the, the, the older, put-together gentleman who's seen it all and done it all and knows it all and will probably tell you. And then there's the upstart renegade who wants to be the next internet sensation. I don't see very much in between those two. So the new up-and-coming internet sensation, is that the phenotype that has been called the Westie in recent years, in recent days? Here, I would even call it the High Westie. Oh, now you're talking my language. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's the you know it's sort of the, the the public land ruffian but you know just put together just so has a little bit of a you know you can tell they're just ripped as could be under that carefully slouched shirt posture and uh it's it's the land of big belt buckles too i'm trying to fit in here i got my i got my big belt buckle on you got a good one there. Uh, a lot of flat brim hats, black, black, black flat brim, and different logos. I even noticed that Adam Weatherby's hat. I mean, he's the CEO, and, and his name's on the company, and yet he, his hat's kind of flat. There's also, if you notice, the cowboy hats are not the dented brim; they're the they're the duster. And the cowboy boots are not your typical pointy toed they're the flat toed Mm -hmm. you know i'm gonna get her done boot i suspect later in the week we might see a lot of ropers showing up yeah with with the the tassels what i like to remind people who wear cowboy boots all the time is they're really just slippers i'd rather get kicked with a pair of slippers than a pair of cowboy boots (laughs) i'm probably gonna get kicked when i go back in there (laughs) <laughs> but that's where we are. And the interesting thing about our, our evening of last night, we went to a, a place called the Bourbon Room, which a generation ago, or I mean, really, even before the uh, Olympics, 
showed up and changed the entire cultural landscape of Salt Lake City, you would not have had a bourbon room in downtown Salt Lake City. Well, Bronson and I were kind of reminiscing about what it's like to drink in Utah now, and it's almost civilized. It's getting there, but they won't pour you a double. They were pretty weak pours, too, if I can just say that. Well, they're supposed to be exactly measured out. Um, so John Zinnel, who used to live here in, in Salt Lake City, his wife, I think it was his wife, studied to be a bartender as a part-time job and failed the test several times. Oh, wait. Uh, I hope Lauren doesn't listen to this podcast. But ap- apparently it's there's a test that's required because... It's complicated. In a lot of places where you're at, like restaurants, you have to order food in order to get served liquor. And so every bartender in the place knows what the cheapest thing on the menu is. So that's that's good. It's always french fries. But apparently at the end of the night, they have to measure their liquor to make sure that it matches up with what the till says that they sold because we don't want any escaping outside of the regulated world of, you know, freedom here in Utah. Still, it's it's light years ahead of where it was. Oh, yeah. I was telling Bronson last night, when I, I used to cover Utah for this great, grubby publication called Fishing and Hunting News. I was the Rocky Mountain editor, and my beat was all of Montana, all of Wyoming, all of Idaho, and all of Utah. This uh, publication came out every two weeks. I was pretty efficient, and I could put all the content together in a week. And then I would just go on a walkabout for that last week. And I spent a lot of time in Utah just exploring the place, getting to know back roads and hunting districts. And um, I would have to fortify myself before coming into the state because there was no way that you could, you know, buy a six-pack at a gas station. You couldn't go into a bar and get a drink. And The one place that kind of... Uh, shattered that a little bit was the town of Price, Utah. And if there's any Utards listening, and I, I say that term affectionately, they're Utards. Uh, Price is sort of the either the Sodom or Gomorrah of Utah. It's coal mining. It's uh, Culturally, it's pretty different from the Mormon culture on the west side of the Wasatch. It's a lot of uh, Irish and Welsh and bars that would were open. But even in Price, Utah, I had to go in there when I was passing through. I wanted to drink in a bar. You had to buy the bottle and a membership in the club. The club would keep your bottle. That was your bottle under the, the bar. And when you came in, presented your card, you got to drink. I think there was a tippage charge, but, you know, you'd already paid for the bottle. Well, I wasn't coming through very often. I think I think I still have a bottle in Price if we want to go check that out tomorrow. I... Mission uh, challenge accepted. It should be well aged by now. It's, it's a yeah. bottle of twenty-seven year Jack Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, spending all that time in glass, it just takes on the notes of well, nothing. Silica. So my first experience with the rules in Utah, and I don't believe they exist anymore. Uh, I was here for an ATA conference when I was still with the Minnesota DNR, and we were up in Park City, and Eric Watts, who'd been the CEO of Easton at the time, hosted a reception at this very nice restaurant, and I was drinking a local, I think it was a Wasatch beer, and I was almost done. There was just a little bit in the bottom, and the waiter comes by, and I was standing there with Eric Watts, and I asked the waiter if I could get another one, and he looked me in the eye and said no. I'm like, excuse me? He says, sir, I can't put an order in for another one until you're done with the one you have. So I promptly finished the beer, you know, guzzled it down. He walked away and put the order in for my beer. And Eric told me that the non-LDS population in, in Park City referred to that law as the guzzle law because it did exactly what I did is it caused people to drink faster so they could order their next round. And I think the intention obviously was to try to dissuade people from drinking too much and slow them down. But that tends to be the problem when regulations are written by people who don't partake in the particular activity they're regulating. So I I run into that same problem sometimes when I'm dealing with state wildlife uh, regulations being written by commissions when there's commissioners that aren't hunters. 
you know, if I have to start with explaining what a 410 is compared to a 20 gauge, my chances of convincing you to legalize the 410 for turkey hunting is probably not very good. So had that experience in Nevada, Nevada, where you can hire a hooker, you can gamble, you can smoke pot. But we're going to draw the line, no killing turkeys with a 410. You can also eat pot. So though. now we know where the moral line is in Nevada. Well, they're trying to protect both those turkeys. Dinger, have you ever had a drink in Utah? I have. Uh, I went to a great little brewery uh, a couple times, a couple different places. Um, one of the, the places that uh, I went was across the street from the park right by the, the is it called the Tabernacle? Is that the... or? What's the, the bit, temple? The temple. The there temple. we go. Yeah, it's a Mormon tabernacle. That's a that's a choir. <laughs> well, the tabernacle choir is headquarters it's there in the temple. Okay. I, I'm betting Dinger was recruited for the tabernacle choir. I was. I, you He's know, a good singer. Yeah. This isn't something I would admit if we had more than one listener, but I was actually the president of my high school choir. I was, you know, I was the only tone deaf. Do they call them presidents? No, well, that's what they called it. It was the only tone deaf president in the history of a choir, but. Alas, I was the president until the fateful day when my friend uh, and I were changing the lyrics to the songs we were supposed to be singing in Latin. Because, you know, Latin just, you don't know what you're saying. And so you are a teenage guy and you change it to things you do know you're saying. And the the teacher heard us. And, uh, well, let's just say... Uh, my rap career was very short-lived, my freestyle career, I should call it, because I got kicked out. So, you know, it was in a full year as the president of the you choir. You kicked out but, of the choir. You know, it was, it was a good run. It was nice. You know, I felt musical, tone deaf, tone deaf though I am. So, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't getting any offers from the Tabernacle Choir, um, but, you know, choir leadership is in, in and on still my resume. Question. So how bad were the lyrics? Because I can see gradations there where maybe you're stripped of your presidential duties and maybe you have to clean the robes for the choir. You know, the, to, to fully kick you out of the choir, I mean, what kind of Satanist lyrics were you singing? Well, I think you're dealing with, at this point, a body of work. You know, maybe the three strikes rule of choirs where this is not the first time you've changed the lyrics of Adoramus Te or Credo and Unum Deum to things that, you know, I don't remember what we were singing, but surely they were more uh, fun to sing than Adoramus Te. And, you know, maybe that wasn't the first time that I had been asked to not do that. It, maybe it was, I don't know. But... So could I intervene here really quickly and talk about Three Strikes? <clears throat> Um, we're all teachers in our own way. Uh, I referenced in our last podcast that we had had a hunter education workshop. And one of the interesting things about being a hunter ed instructor is, you know, you, it's, it's the funnel. You get every, everybody. And it's, we typically in Montana are teaching rising 12 year olds. So they're 11 year old, they're fifth and sixth graders. It's a pretty rambunctious age. And so there's often some interesting classroom dynamics. You got 20 of them. It's after school. They're tired. They're kind of hangry a little bit. So there's usually something you got to do. And my take on it is I just immediately separate the talkers. Like, you know, zero. Uh, nope. You talk to your buddy. You're disrupting them. You're going to sit over here for the rest of the class. But one of my fellow ed, hunter ed instructors told me last weekend at our little workshop, all he does, he says, uh, this is Chuck Hyatt, if you're listening, from Bainville, Montana. He says, if anybody has a cell phone in class, I want to see it disabled and on the desk, on the surface. There's nobody going to be texting under the desk, out of sight. He said, if I happen to put my cell phone in front of you and on the board, he types in his four-digit access code. So everybody knows it. He says, if I put my phone in front of you, I expect you to open my phone, dial the four digits, and call your parents to have them come pick you up. Holy cow. Wow. <laughs> like, okay. I I couldn't even look him in the eye. Oh my I mean, God. Was, <laughs> that's effective. Man, the Joseph Stalin of 
<laughs> honor ed instructor of, ba- of Badeville. Jeez. Well, and just imagine in Badeville, they have to send at this time of year a dog sled team to pick up the kids. <laughs> so that's a big it's deal. It's a big ask. Jeez, you're out buying the store out of bread and milk and you got to scurry in the snowmobile over to get your kid from Hunter Ed. That's a bad day. So I don't want to, mono- I felt like I monopolized our conversation a little bit last week and I don't want to do that. But I do want to ask a question that probably will re- result in me talking at least somewhat. But Bronson and I are here at, as functionaries, I guess, for the Mule Deer Foundation, which Maybe the sort of you know it's it's the it's the most emblematic of the critter groups as we call them the species specific conservation groups icon of the West icon of the West. Now it's not just species obviously it's also the landscapes they inhabit. So if you think about it we've got you know the, we have groups for quail and for ducks maybe a couple for ducks for elk for wild turkeys spiders spiders. <laughs> What I'm getting at, and I want to ask this question is, are the conservation needs that resulted in the origin of these groups as relevant now as they were when they were started? What a, wow. what a question. What an invitation to step on one's own genitalia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean... So, I mean, I, I, it's not an open end. I mean, I, I'm very, very curious about this because I think there still are great conservation needs. Certainly, I look at Ducks Unlimited has become essentially a water organization. Um, I think the, the needs, the aquatic needs of America and the continent are not going away. Then, If anything, they're increasing. I, so I think the relevancy is, 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 if anything, increasing for that organization. You know, I was the state president for the National Wild Turkey Federation in Montana for years, I felt like we achieved our conservation mission, and I think we were at a bit of a crossroads of what to do next. Um, so I, I, I guess the question, maybe to put it more of a point on, are there life cycles to these groups? Well, I guess that's really yeah. it. I'm, I, I'm curious, because I think, I think species-specific conservation has brought a lot of us into this world. Um, is it still worth our time and, and, and the work that we do on behalf of them? So, well, I think the history of conservation is too short to really think of it in cycles yet because 100 years ago, none of these organizations existed, uh, the critter groups. There were hardly any local game and fish clubs even, you know, just think 19, 1919, there was maybe some local hunting and fishing clubs, but in all likelihood, there wasn't in your community because, well, half the West, there were hardly any communities at all, but there weren't any game. The populations were really, really low. And when you look at the organizations that kind of led the recovery of wildlife, it starts with the Boone and Crockett Club and Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot and George Bird Grinnell and all of those icons of American conservation history that started the conservation movement. And when you look at the early days, conservation clubs, they were game and fish clubs, hunting clubs, rod and gun clubs. They were local, largely men's organizations, organized on a community basis. They were fraternal organizations probably first. They were a place for the guys to go and drink high west, high west whiskey away from their wives with their friends that enjoyed hunting and fishing with them. Um, and they, uh, they attacked issues at a local level they you know they were stocking their local trout streams and they were building a local gun range even some of the national groups when you think about them like the ikes Mm -hmm. they still operated locally it was local clubs even though there was this national isaac walton league that existed it was the local club that was doing the work and i think this transition to the critter group model it might reflect the fact that People have had a, a plethora of wildlife over the last 50 years compared to what they had before, and they started specializing. And specializing is not necessarily a bad thing, but if you only are wound up about ducks and don't care about grasslands, well, like if you're only working on wetlands, you, you know, you talked about Ducks Unlimited being focused on wetlands. 
We need grasslands to grow ducks, too. All of those things stitched together. I wonder if we're moving in a direction where the altruism and, and the, the kind of the, the looking at the, the ecosystem and not just species is probably a direction we're heading back to just because I think people are realizing that everything's connected. It's Mule Deer Foundation. Yeah, we, we're organized around mule deer because we draw mule deer tags and we hunt mule deer, but sage habitat is really what Mule Deer Foundation does. Taking out pinion juniper so that sage can grow, protect you know, trying to fight cheat grass and all of those things. It's it's a habitat, it's an ecosystem approach. So even the critter groups are being more holistic than just worrying about one species. You know, there was a time when people thought of, you know, if we if we care about trout, we're gonna grow them in a hatchery and release them, and if we care about pheasants, we're gonna grow them in a hatchery, you know, and, and release them. And we've moved past that. I think we've realized that's short-sighted, that if we can work on habitat and be holistic about it, then it's self-sustaining, and it benefits so many other things besides just the individual critter that's on the name of the organization. But that being said, I still have my affinity for ducks and pheasants and mule deer and elk, and I kind of like individual critter groups and I think it's okay that they exist and they're working holistically, more holistically than they used to. I don't know. That was rambling. But as listeners of the podcast know, that's what I do sometimes. Get off my lawn, you communist! I mean, you're not allowed to rant anymore, so we get rambles instead. I think I kind of want rants back, don't you, McKean? Yeah, rants, I like the vein on his forehead sitting across from him. A ramble, he doesn't get red-faced. The vein on his forehead does not get all inflated and kind of throbby. Yeah. You need a trigger question. I, I think that my answer to your question, Andrew, is I think that obviously in various areas of the country, things ebb and flow. So um, while in eastern Nebraska where I live, the work of the NWTF from a turkey conservation standpoint is I would consider pretty much done. Um, in that there's more turkeys here than probably at any time in history, given, you know, turkeys benefit from big, tall trees and windbreaks and farms in, in ways that, you know, those, those things weren't there previously. Um, but I, I saw a post on Facebook the other day, uh, from somebody in Kansas who, uh, was positing that a turkey farm in Kansas was responsible for the fact that at one point, a few years ago, they would see, uh, over a hundred turkeys at a time in various fields in this area. And now you can't find turkeys in that area. And I think that's an example of how things ebb and flow. And while maybe five years ago in central Kansas, they, you know, they had more turkeys than they knew what to do with. Um, maybe now there's a habitat issue or there's a disease issue or something that's cropped up that sort of regenerates the need for uh, local conservation work. Um, the second thing I think that those organizations do that isn't necessarily about the species, but happens to be a byproduct of the way they make money, is I know for me, the five or six banquets I go to a year, usually a couple NWTF and a PF and a Ducks Unlimited, you know, those are chances for me to be with my hunting friends in a context outside of hunting that kind of keeps the, the pilot lit. And I can tell you time and again in my life, you know, we'll bring a guest or we'll have somebody sit at a table with us that hasn't been hunting and ends up, you know, finding that that group of people is pretty fun to be with. And because those people are fun to be with, might accept an invitation on a hunt. Um, I, the two big hunts I take every year to South Dakota have at least three people in both that are a byproduct of that. So uh, I think that's a reflection of something that those organizations are all starting to look at. And that is that the, the source of their funding in, in many cases and the reason they exist in part has to do with not just preserving the specific species that is their namesake, but also preserving the, the hunters that are their funding source. And so I think you're seeing in most of the big NGOs an admission that some of their work is done, but that they all share a role in recruiting new people into the outdoors. And, and so, you know, thus programs across the board are coming out for R3 and for recruitment for retention and that kind of thing. So I think it, they're amoebas. They're going to morph and, and change shape over time. But 
I certainly like the world with them in it more than without. Well, I think you, Andrew? W- w- this is Ryan. I think that. <laughs> Sorry, that was a dickhead move. <laughs> no, but I can tell you were rising to it. This is the beauty of being together. Like, I deferred. You wanted to say right, something. Right. Oh, but I have something to say, too. Well, yours will be very eloquent after I'm done. But <laughs> So conservation is temporary. Everything is in a state of change. And it's while we have great turkey populations now, they could go away. I mean, we had a time where this continent had millions of bison, and they went away. So having a robust population today does not mean that you'll have a robust population tomorrow. And so the conservation mission for these groups doesn't necessarily end just because populations are recovered and doing well. So I think that's important. Pivoting and worrying about long-term habitat work to sustain wildlife populations is important. Working on the hunter recruitment mission, like like the Wild Turkey Federation is is doing, pivoting away from trap and transplanted turkeys is good. And, and I think I am only aware of one critter group ever that declared mission accomplished and went away. And there was an organization that was based in Minnesota, because all great things are, called Geese Unlimited. And they operated out of the Twin Cities area, and they worked on restoring giant Canada geese. They helped fundraise to, to and mission accomplished. And I'm sure that they were getting death threats from farmers <laughs> and, and golf course managers and stuff. They're the only nonprofit conservation critter group that I'm aware of that said, we accomplished our mission. We're going to close up shop, liquidate our assets and re- just retire. And they did. Well, it's interesting, you know, one of the, one of the critters that has historically been underserved is the white-tailed deer. And, and, you know, I, I was at the ground floor of some discussions of maybe there should be a deer hunters conservation group. But the interesting thing with that is, you know, by the time the need was recognized, it wasn't to bring back or, or to have sort of sort of population influence on the, on the species. It was to start to have a collective voice of the deer hunter. That's been an interesting experiment. We could devote an entire podcast to just that. Deer hunters are tribal, as could possibly be. You think about how we divide ourselves into bow hunters versus rifle hunters or traditional bow hunters versus compound bow hunters. and There are even finer divisions than that. So it's been, it's been interesting to bring it back. But Eric, I think you actually have a, a, a really important point that the social aspect of what we do when we get together on behalf of conservation is kind of a quiet, um, but I would say equal in importance to what we do for the critter or the habitat. And I actually haven't recognized that until you mentioned that, but my best friend, my best hunting buddy, Mark Copenhaver, and I met at a Wild Turkey Federation banquet. And, and you know, there's a number of other friends I have who I wouldn't be friends with, or certainly at the intensity of friendship that we have, without kind of going through the crucible of being on banquet organizing committees and kind of going through we got to you know we got to throw a party in every one of these if if our listener has been involved in these it's it's actually it's pretty interesting dynamic of terror that nobody's going to show up angst that we don't have enough food for the people who might show up concern that people aren't going to bid enough and raise enough money for our what we've done and then finally celebration that she's it all worked out after all I do think, and this is almost a challenge to critter groups and really organizations of any stripe, where I see critter groups fail is not necessarily because of their mission. It's because the people who deliver it appear to be in service of themselves. So a regional director who is just ramrodding these volunteers, but yet the volunteers don't feel like they're the real deal and in it for the behalf of the resource. Or... um, the conservation group superstructure that just seems insatiable in terms of what it takes from communities and doesn't give back in kind. So I guess the challenge is, I think our conservation needs are actually more intense and um, insatiable as ever. I want to see more of the resources that we as citizen conservationists devote to it go back to that resource and really have, as, as Bronson said, that the bigger picture sort of 
what was the term you used? You had a good adjective for it. The ecosystem-wide, the holistic approach to conservation. And that, mm-hmm. that's, that bucket's never going to get filled up. Nope. But we got to keep doing it. I mean, as, as with any entity, the bigger it gets, the more bigger entities start to develop a, a capital structure that serves the pr- preservation of the entity. And so that's just my other caution is don't get too big that you can't serve your mission. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to piggyback on what you're saying there, Andrew. And, you know, at the a risk of, of alienating some dear friends in the industry, I'm not going to name any names. But one of the things that I notice in organizations, bigger national organizations, is at the local level, they're at times experts at co-opting credit for things that they aren't really doing. Um, sometimes there's not as much there there as they'd have you believe. And I realize they do that because they have this giant fundraising imperative at the national level, and it looks really good. What I worry about sometimes is, does that giant fundraising imperative trample on the good things that are very local that need to happen and need funding? And I'll give you an example, Andrew. In your life, you have Highline Sportsman. And... You know, by all means, people should support NWTF and Pheasants Forever and and Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation in those areas. But if Highline Sportsman is an entity that's capable of doing one day a turkey project because it needs done, and then the next day doing, you know, a trash cleanup at C- on CRP, just because somebody from one of the bigger organizations that shows up doesn't mean that they they should get the credit and be able to raise the money for being involved in those projects. And so when it comes to a species group, what that species group is really, really good at is the landscape level projects that pertain to the, to the surviving and advancing of that species. And almost everything else they touch, they're, they're kind of along for the ride on. And again, at the risk of pissing people off for saying that, I, I can think of several dozen examples I'll leave out. But I think the best example of of conservation work at the local level, getting work done that needs done at the local level is, is what you're doing with the Highline Sportsman. I have no idea what you're talking about, but <laughs> I... You don't? No, I, I mean, I mean <laughs> kind of, but I'm going to take the entry into the Highline Sportsman because I, I, we mentioned it previously on the podcast. I'm going to be really brief about it, but it's occupying a bit of my life because our third annual banquet is February 23rd. But that organization is a direct outreach of local dissatisfaction with the critter groups. Is We felt like we were raising a great deal of money, holding an awesome party, and really couldn't look our neighbors in the face when they asked what we did with the money. I mean, we were sending it away to serve a bigger organization. And we got some back. And, I mean, we definitely could rationalize what we were doing. But we also felt like our conservation needs were weren't categorized as easily as those in a critter group. We had lots of stuff in our community that needed help. Why don't we put on a great party and keep all the money locally? It's worked magnificently with one exception, and that's that holistic conservation. Doing these sort of one-by-one small local groups, I think, fill a need that exists in every community. What the best-behaving national groups are doing is filling that bigger role of entire landscapes. And so... To Bronson's point, in terms of the history of conservation organization, what Highland Sportsmen do is really going back to that local Rodney right. Young Club. What we're doing is saying, okay, we know that we can benefit landowners who allow pub- the public to hunt their land could use gate closures. So we buy the materials in the Hinsdale sh- High School shop class builds them and we distribute them to hunters who or landowners who allow public hunting. That's awesome. It's tiny. But the ripple effects of that are huge. So we do that times 100 with little projects in our county. But we can't touch grasslands conservation issues. They're just too big. They're massive. So I think it takes all. It's, on, it's to borrow yeah. an Obama phrase. It's all of the that's, above. That's the exact point. Andrew, that's, you made the point I was trying to make more eloquently, not surprisingly, since you do eloquence for a living. Uh, <laughs> um, My point was, you know, you would go to a species-specific group and they would talk about habitat projects or they would talk about, 
you know, doing things to recruit hunters. But what they really do is national landscape level habitat projects. And I think sometimes people misconstrue the idea that that stuff's going to happen in my backyard or that, you know, somebody from the big critter organization is going to be the person helping start the mentor program or yeah, I you see. Know, yep. making something in my backyard happen. And yes, they will talk about those things. And then when I use the word co-opt, I mean, they will put their logo on those things, but, but the people getting the, you know, the mentoring program started at, the Highline Sportsman's level are the Highline Sportsman's people and, and not necessarily the big national organization whose mission really may not be, you know, Ducks Unlimited is a great example. You know, protecting wetlands in your neck of the woods may not be the best use of their money versus, you know, north of you. Right. They're going to target because they're going to have a priority. They're going to focus on shallow lakes, for instance. If you don't have a shallow lake in your area, that might not be what Ducks Unlimited spends their money on. Um, that's a good example. You know, this is a phenomenon that's not unique just to the conservation groups. I see it in the hunting for-profit product industry all the time. I see organizations that claim that they're great champions of conservation. And when you look at what they do, they sell product to be sold in banquets. So they, their magnanimity is that they sold product to a nonprofit instead of selling it in a store. That's great. Maybe you offered a great discount, but it takes more than that to make sure that conservation lives on forever. I look at my, my company. I'm standing on the shoulder of giants, uh, two conservation managers in, in federal premiums history, did huge things. George McCullough started the 4-H conservation camps back in the 30s and created a whole conservation ethic through the 4-H program that helped make sure that the Dust Bowl didn't happen again and taught a whole generation of, of new farmers how to put habitat on the landscape. That's, some, that's a story you don't hear because it's hard to advertise, but it's, it, it was huge. Bill Stevens, my direct predecessor... He built the 4 H shooting sports program. So when we talk about R3 programs today, he, he was building those things in the 1970s and 1980s that are bringing hundreds of thousands of kids into the shooting sports every year. Those, those were real things. I, I'm a poser compared to the work that these guys had done in previous generations. But I am very proud of the fact that my company spends money on real things that make sure that there is a future for our industry. Not just the 11% excise tax, which on average has been $85 million a year over the last uh, five years that our company has spent, but investing in efforts and organizations that are going to make sure there's a future for our sport, but also lobbying and working on public policy things. And and accepting the fact that we're going to get screwed on shooting range preservation bill, but we're we're going to accept that because the Land and Water Conservation Fund is pretty important. I mean, I could go out and try to take down this sportsman's bill because we got screwed. We're not going to do that because the bigger conservation mission is more important. And so I see these, cons these, these for-profit companies – in the industry that'll put out a press release and they'll they'll try to challenge other companies to do more for conservation. When you look at them, they, they really haven't done anything up to this point. And for them, it's a marketing and sales uh, strategy. So it's not unique just to the big critter groups that have, have gotten big. Um, I realize that sounds self-serving because my company is a conservation leader. But I'm also trying to shame the rest of the industry into helping me because I'm getting tired, guys. I need help. I need another bourbon. All right, that was pretty close to a rant. That was that was rantish. Did you see the vein? It just started to throb a little bit, and I realized how awkward that does sound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so to really tone this down and maybe like ask the question of the day: um, peas or carrots? Carrots. Roasted in the drippings of a Miller duck in a roasting pan. Peas. Peas in chicken noodle soup. Peas in pasta with a, like a vodka sauce and deer sausage. Mm. What's a vodka sauce? Mm. 
It's a sauce. It's like classic Italian. It's like a light tomato sauce with cream and vodka and peas, for God's sakes. I think that's illegal here in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's talk dogs. How's your dog, Bikin? You got any stories lately? Oh, yeah. She's, like, this cold weather is, um, oh, actually, I do have got a couple of things. This cold weather has, it's been hard on her. Um, she loves, when, I mean, she loves the snow, she loves the winter, she loves being outside all the time, but we humans don't love it as much as her, so we don't go out as much as her as she needs to go, so she's a little stir-crazy. You know, I've told you about her sock fetish in the morning. I think she feels a little guilty about it because she will glean every sock from the house, and bring it in and make a big pile in the kitchen. But when I look at her hard, she won't come for a petting. And I, I think it's something to do with she knows the socks are a bridge too far, but she can't help herself. The the big O there, I'm going to finish with Nellie. Have you guys heard of uh, the have limp tail syndrome? Slack tail, they call it? Mm-mm. So apparently, and we saw, I actually saw this in Louisiana in December with a dog. It was obviously not as nearly as cold there, but one of the dogs was a cold morning. It's been a good deal of time in the water. You could just tell it was, an, it was uncomfortable. This black lab was just, wouldn't, didn't want to sit down, didn't like it's, the base of its tail touched. Nellie had the same thing in, in our first cold snap in oh, early December. Um, the guy in Louisiana said, "Oh, that, we call that slack tail." Man, you know, whatever. It's you know, it's a it's it's a Cajunism. Well, slack tail. I think I got slack tail too a few times. Um, he said it's from the cold water and it 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 uh, numbs the nerves at the base of the tail. Anyway, in this last cold spell we've had, twenty one below in Glasgow this morning, by the way. Uh, Nellie has had a real sensitive base of her tail too. So, just if anybody's got any wisdom on that, I'd love to hear it. I think uh, if you've got an experience with it, tell us about it on our Facebook page. Ding. Which you can find where? On Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> on Gravel. Nat- Natalie Krebs smiles. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, the name of the podcast is On Gravel, and the Facebook page is facebook.com slash On Gravel. You got it. How's old Scout doing? All right, so I... Oh, man, she's as stir-crazy as can be. She's staring at me right now like, you got to be kidding me. We're going to talk more. She really needs to get out. We're going to go uh, clean up after a tower shoot this weekend. I, I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to go take her and try and find some some stray birds. Um, so I do have a couple stories for you. I shot a... Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll wait till the sound of <laughs> envy. No, no, keep going. Please, please go. This is a little soundtrack to your story. <laughs> oh, so jealous. <laughs> please tell me it's not High West. It's, is it? It's seven up, I think. Buffalo Trace. All right, so you, I, I got this idea that after I butchered the, I shot a antlerless deer right at the last light of the last day of the antlerless season this year because I love deer meat. And uh, I had read that deer femurs make great dog bones. And so, as the article said, I froze the femur to make sure that there was nothing wrong with it. And gave it to Scout and thought nothing of it. Scout thought it was like Christmas. It was the greatest day ever for Scout. Well, the next day, she's unsettled. She farts all the time, as we've documented. The farts are just... I can't even tell you they're just it's so bad and she likes to be by my feet all the time and pretty soon she's really unsettled wondering what the heck's going on it's not time to go out next thing i know the the rest of the team walks into my office and they're like you you're gonna have to you're gonna have to go out there i I don't know about you guys but when my dog craps she doesn't crap in one place she like walks she moves she She had oh my god she had something come out of her that I, I mean, you guys have had, you have labs, you know what I'm talking about. Like the most putrid, vile, unconscionable smell I have ever smelled in my life, covering roughly 200 square feet in my office. Everywhere. And my happy ass during the business day has to figure out how to juggle between a conference call to go and get this out of the carpet and not one little speck of it is solid clearly not a delegator 
Oh, I mean, how do you delegate that? I don't hate anybody <laughs> bad enough to make them do that. Throw a binder at them to start with. <laughs> Uh, God. So, so then, you know, being the genius that I am, I'm like, well, I must've had to boil it. So I boiled the other one and uh, the femur, so we're going back to the that, femur. Yeah, you a poop boiler? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I got you. Yeah. There's two femur. Yeah. I didn't boil any poop. Didn't boil any of the rim. So I was like, well, it can't, it's just a bone. Like, why would it matter that much? Um, so I boiled the other one, far less meat or anything on it. Well, this one, she cracked open got into it so as soon as i saw that i took it away from her (laughs) lo and behold next day i take her out she doesn't have to go i'm watching her close get on a conference call or maybe a podcast and the guys walk in again and she has done it now twice in about three weeks and so you know the old neanderthal learned his lesson no more dog bones no more deer femurs for the dog despite how sad that makes her i'm sure because she sure loved him but I'm not cleaning that stuff up again. That is, that's the worst. It's, I can't think of anything. I've changed 5,000 baby diapers. I've not changed one anywhere near the level of this disgustingness. Maybe you should put a diaper on her. Mm. Taper vent. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so Taper have either of you vent. had experience with anal gland issues with your dog? <laughs> oh, with, with your dog. <laughs> well, yeah, way to qualify that. No, but on our South Dakota trip that you were part of, yeah, do you remember the anal gland incident in the RV? I don't. I think it was one of Uncle Ken's Griffons had an anal gland issue, and somebody had it wasn't me had to go and express it. Express it. I was going to say suppress it, but it was already being suppressed. Oh, but all right, that's all I know. All right, so Soka, my dog, when she was a brand new puppy and and i was still putting water in her food so it was soft she just started to stink and it was i don't know how to describe it it's just it's not it's not putrid but it's pungent it's pungent and it is strong and my wife is like uh, 27 year old jack daniels (laughs) thank you so and my wife is part werewolf and she is very, so she is very sensitive smelling and and I don't have as sensitive a smell and she would smell it and it would just cause her to become apoplectic so I did the research and I, I stopped putting water in her food if the dog has to push a little harder to get the poop out then they express their own anal gland and okay fine we had an incident here a few weeks ago where that pungent smell returned and Soka, we let her up on the furniture, and, and she has to lay on a blanket, but she likes to lay up next to us on the couch. And my wife and I were down watching Netflix, like the kids do, and where the smell was there, and she hops up, and my wife just, smell triggers her. And so she's just going nuts, and she doesn't want to have the dog anywhere near. And then Soka turns and rubs her butt against the couch, our brand new sectional couch in our basement. And my wife smells it, and she can smell the anal gland stuff, and she's she stormed upstairs and just dis- disappeared. Sorry, I gesticulated with my hands and hit a lamp here, Eric. So she storms upstairs and leaves me to deal with the dog. So I took the dog, and it's... 20 below, so I'm not going to go outside to do this. So I took her up to the shower, turned the shower on, and had it running, got the dog, pulled her tail up, and the anal glands are on each side of the anus. And so you just have to gently squeeze them, and holy shit, I don't know, it was half a shot <laughs> of brown fluid come squirting out. And... I washed it and washed it and washed it, but my wife could smell it in the shower. It was my shower, me and my wife's shower. She could smell it the next morning. It was was not good. However, I must have done a good job expressing that anal gland. It might be one of my hidden talents. I might put it on my resume right next to, you know, president of the choir. And (laughs) talk about expressing anal glands because she hasn't stunk since then. But it's one of those things when you, you go online, they say try to increase the fiber in in the diet so that the dog has to push a little bit and they'll they'll take care of it. Um, but I got to tell you, I've never had a problem. Purina 
pro plan has been good to me as long as I don't feed her anything that's got lamb in it. Lamb will cause my dog to stink a little bit, but as long as it's chicken based, I'm good. So I want to thank Carl Gunzer and the people at Purina Pro Plan for providing quality nutrition for my dog. Well, with that, how about, how about one of them? How about one of them sponsorships, Purina? Yeah, how about throwing us a little bit of that <laughs> Nestle, uh, uh, you know, sponsorship money? So I, I, I don't. I'm going to address the elephant in the room here. We haven't had a good joke in some time, and I'm not. I'm not. I don't want anybody to force it. I just want to say that there's a need to be fulfilled here. Um, I feel like I've got my marching orders when it comes to content generation, and I will be expressing anal glands and everything I write for the next week. Nice. Gesticulate while you do it, will you? Yeah. What do you mean we haven't had a good joke? The ant joke was good. That's pure gold. It got three and a half kins from you, McKean. I, look, I'm right here across from you, waiting to guffaw my teeth out, and I got not. There's nothing. Been working at a trade show. Okay, well, uh, with that, we we got a party to go to. Bronson. Yes, we do. Landscape scale scale conservation can also be very very entertaining. Eric. All right, you two, stay out of the high west. No promises. See you in price. <laughs> All right, see you guys. <laughs> All right, so long. Uh, until next week, keep it right here on Gravel.